solid state, dry coating, lithium iron, sodium iron, lithium phosphate, 18650, 2170, 4680. The list seems endless and many people don't know what all this means or which battery is best for you. Welcome to Dave's EV Battery Guide 101. I'm Dave, welcome to Dave Takes It On. Now, just before we look at where we're going, it helps to see where we've been. The first EVs did not have a selection of batteries available to them. They just had to select the best, best that was on offer at the time. That turned out to be the 18650 lithium ion batteries, and they're based on NMC or nickel manganese cobalt in proportions eight to one to one. The nickel is the powerhouse of the cathode, but the manganese and cobalt are vitally needed to make it all work. Cobalt in particular was expensive to buy, uh, very difficult to work with, came with a number of moral issues, uh, which by the way, it never really seemed to bother the mobile phone, tablet and laptop industries prior to the arrival of EVs. Well, these batteries were already in mass production, easily available in large quantities for use in mobile devices, including power tools, mobility scooters, and of course, laptops, tablets, and smartphones. Uh, by the way, the 18650, if anyone wants to know, it's merely a way to know what size you had. In this case, 18 is the diameter, 65 is the length, all in millimeters, and zero is actually a circle. It just means it's a round battery. And the voltage in all of these was 3.5 to 3.7, varied in between there. Well, they're still critical to many of today's modern phones and tablets and power tools, where a smaller, thinner product was deemed more desirable. These pack a lot of uh, power for their punch. For the EV industry, size is important, but not critical. So the 18650 was used in huge numbers, but they weren't ideal because these were designed for more gentle charging and power output, things like drills, torches, smartphones, they turned out to have three main snags when they were used in EVs. First one was temperature control. It became critical because overheating damaged the batteries. Overheating also could lead to thermal runaway. This is where the battery could actually just spontaneously catch fire. And third, but not least, while a one-hour charge on a mobile phone is not the end of the world, most people plug them in overnight, a one-hour charge on an EV was a decided limiting factor on a road trip. So there was a massive effort to balance a really quick charging time with protection and safety. Uh, not all EV manufacturers succeeded. But slowly EV, EVs began to catch on, equally slowly battery manufacturers began to develop specific systems for EVs which answered these three issues. Thermal management in the car meant that the thermal runaway fires they have just about been eliminated. But they also, because they kept the batteries cooler, allowed for faster charging times. But the size and the power was not what they wanted. It took several thousand 18650 batteries to power an EV. For example, my Tesla Model S has got well over 7,000 individual batteries. Think of these a bit like the bigger version of the AA battery. Those are 14 510s in comparison. But they also have a lower power. They are 1.45 volts as against 3.5 or 3.7, so less than half the power. But with the growth of EVs, so came the first of the batteries actually meant for them. These were the 2170s. They dropped the O at the end because all the batteries they were using were round. They made it just longer and wider. There's no point, by the way, in just making it bigger. That achieves very little. But while both the voltage um, were, were the same on both batteries, an 18650 could only store about 3,500 milliamp hours. The 2170 could uh, store between four and 5,000 milliamp hours. That was a huge leap in storage for a very small hop in size. And so this became the standard size, which it is still to this day. Well, just. The chemistry was also changing and the first big leap came with LFP batteries. Stands for lithium ion batteries. That's ion, I-O-N, not ion, I-R-O-N. These have little or no uh, nickel manganese cobalt of any sort in them, so they got away from the cobalt, high cost and 
child labour issues and used much cheaper chemicals which were easier to work with. But with the change came contrasting benefits. They were very much cheaper, but they were also very less powerful. Comparing a 2170 battery, the NMC has around about 150 to 220 watt hours per kilogram. The LFP has 90 to 120. You needed even more of them, but they were really cheap. But to get a kilowatt hour of NMC cost about $500, while the LFP was nearer 450. But by the way, whatever price I quote, they're out of date already. They're constantly dropping. So just use these figures to show the relative cost. But even with more batteries, it's still up to 10% cheaper to cram in LFP rather than NMC. But they also took in and gave out less maximum power. They produced slower EVs. It took a little bit longer to charge as well. But because the early EVs, particularly the Teslas, were absolute rockets with 0 to 60 times of 3 to 5 seconds, they could still produce a fast, more sensible acceleration. But in terms of battery life, and this is a fact that many EV buyers quote, but in reality it's quite trivial. An NMC battery is good for NMC battery is good for up to 2,000 cycles. Cycle being a full discharge down to zero and a full recharge up to 100%. If you top up just 10% each time, that's not a cycle. You need 10 of them to make a cycle. When equivalent LFP battery can handle well over 3,000. So why is this trivial? Well. With an average battery size of about 50 kilowatt hours and cars nowadays doing four miles per kilowatt hour, typical EV with NMC can cover around 400,000 miles, while the LFP battery could cover 600,000. In plain English, most cars are scrapped at least oh, way less than 20 years old. So unless you're doing over 20,000 miles every single year, EV drivers will never be able to get anywhere near that mileage out of their car battery. However, on a positive note, if your EV does eventually fall apart, 20 years old, uh, just from old age, you can still take out the battery pack and get many more years out of it, powering your entire house off-grid. Well, development now in 2020, Tesla announced they developed a totally new battery and it took, well, took a so-called car company to come up with the really simple concept that nobody else in the massive battery industry was working on at the time. Tesla guessed that if the 2170 packed more power per kilogram than an 18650, then an even bigger battery should do even more still. So they came up with the 4680, and this is massive. I think it's more like heading towards the size of a tin of beans rather than an AA battery. And the early results are they're now in cars with the Model Y, some model, uh, some Cybertrucks, and some semi trucks having them installed. And they're actually getting about 250 watt hours per kilogram. So this is an amazing increase, about 50% over an ordinary NMC and over twice the density of an LFP. But even today, these are not in full production. So what's gone wrong? Well, Tesla work in a strange way. While they have become one of the world's largest battery producers in their own right, several billion made to date, with most of these being 2170s, they also pass their design onto all their major battery manufacturers under a license and shared agreement. Companies like CATL, LG, Samsung, Panasonic. And they worked alongside Tesla to develop these. And they all hit some serious problems. But they also had the world's best and cleverest battery scientists working for them, both in-house and with their partners. And to date, the combined effort is not yet mass production. It's getting closer. Now, many people laugh at, ridicule Tesla for continuously putting back dates, in this case, date of the first mass-produced 4680 year after year. Well, to illustrate just how complicated it really is, most battery companies have also switched design to the 4680s, as the advantages are absolutely huge. Obviously, they can't just copy Tesla's design, it's all patented, so they've all developed their own version, also based on 4680s, which now seems to be becoming an industry standard. But despite them all working on this issue for the last four years, only Panasonic is getting close, and that could be this year. LG is now targeting 2028 for their launch. Um, I see that as an absolute huge achievement for Tesla to have beaten 
the battery experts, or rather, they probably snatched all the battery experts off the market for themselves. And by the way, for those who claim CATL solved, CATL solved it with the Shenzhen battery, it's not. That's not size specific. It's not a 4680. It can be applied to all batteries, and in the early days, it will be on 2170s. But all the battery manufacturers are trying to solve the same double problem. The first is production time. Currently, almost everyone uses a wet coating of active material on top of an aluminium foil backing. This needs to dry completely before it can be rolled up tightly. And this drying process takes anything up to, well, between 12 and 24 hours. And accounts for about 40% of the total energy used to make the battery. Well, that process also produces hazardous waste that needs to be distilled to recycle it and get rid of it safely. Neither is desirable in a mass production line. So, all battery companies are now investigating dry coatings, where the active ingredients are simply glued and then pressed, ironed if you like, onto the foil backing. It's pretty instant. Well, the second problem is the actual mass production method. You see, it works fine on a smaller scale, thinner batteries, but has disadvantage as you increase the size, one of these being heat. You can hand make batteries really easy using any chemistry you want, quickly, safely, accurately. But when you try and transfer that process onto the production line, which is the only way of getting these down to a decent price so they can sell them, they, they just keep hitting snags. So we're pretty much up to date on NMC and LFP batteries with Tesla already ready to incorporate them into what's called a structural battery pack. Tesla already made one-piece castings for the front and rear chassis, while most of the legacy auto is still assembling and welding dozens of bits together with robots and all sorts of good goodies. So when the competitors mount their battery pack, it is a physical battery pack that has a case, solid frame, the whole lot is bolted onto their chassis or frame, which took hours to make. That adds weight. Tesla developed a central chassis frame that had the space for the batteries built into it, reducing the weight dramatically, simplifying construction process. So in effect, the Model Y has a one-piece aluminium casting, one at the front, one at the rear, and a central cast frame, which is also the battery pack. So in a sub-assembly area, they build up the battery pack, put all the batteries in, heating, cooling, uh, wiring everything into it, then when it's finished, they just put carpet on top, some seats um, and uh, belts and things, and that's finished. All they need to do then is do the same with the castings, front and rear. So on those, they will bolt on suspension, brakes, steering, motors, everything else. And so they end up with three bits and they just bolt all those together. That is a very quick and simple process. And once it's done, you drop a body shell on it. Job done. It's amazingly efficient, dropping the time and therefore the cost of making EV. All they need now is the 4680 batteries in mass production. And in a shock announcement recently, Tesla claimed that they were ready to go into full mass production. But if they can't, they're now able to buy finished batteries from both LG and Panasonic cheaper and quicker than dragging out their own production problems. Either way, looks like the 4680s are here this year and they will dramatically shake up the EV industry. Despite already having the lowest cost in the whole of the EV world by far and the highest profits in the EV world by far, the 4680 will launch them into a totally different league. Well, thanks for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, please click the like button. If you want to see more, please subscribe. We've got a follow up to this, the next generation. We are, by the way, rapidly approaching 10,000 subscribers, an absolutely amazing achievement for such a new channel. So massive thank you to each and every one of you viewers. Each one is important to us. Also to our subscribers, which YouTube uses to see how popular they will make our videos. The more subscribers means that the video is being shown to more people who are new to the channel. And a huge welcome to all our Patreon members who support the channel. Without you, we would not be where we are today. Thanks for watching. I'm Dave.